Major advances in climate science have provided us with the clearest picture yet of how the Earth's climate functions and how human activities affect it. It is now an undisputable fact that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean, frozen parts of our planet and land. The scales and rates of recent changes are unprecedented over thousands of years. Changes in the climate can be seen and felt everywhere in the world. This report tells us that changes in climate are rapid, widespread, and intensifying, and that humans are the main cause of these changes. To measure how the climate is changing, scientists have looked at key indicators. The average temperature of the Earth's surface over the last decade is 1.1 degrees Celsius higher compared with the late 19th century. Each of the last four decades has been successively the warmest on record since 1850. Levels of gases that trap heat in our atmosphere continue to increase rapidly. Current carbon dioxide levels are now the highest in at least two million years. They result from burning fossil fuels and deforestation. Scientists have observed a global retreat of glaciers that is unprecedented in at least the last few thousand years. And this warming has far-reaching consequences everywhere, including more hot extremes, heavy rainfalls, droughts and fire weather. The ocean is undergoing multiple changes, including warming, more marine heat waves, rapid Arctic sea ice retreat, acidification and loss of oxygen. And the sea level is rising at an increasing rate. Sea level rise will affect coastal communities, coastal cities and low-lying islands. In particular, these areas will experience more frequent coastal flooding events in the future. Sea level rise is very slow to adapt to any reductions in emissions. So sea level rise we, we experience this century will effectively be irreversible for many centuries to come. This report was the first IPCC report to assess low likelihood, high impact outcomes. So for example, when we assessed future projections of sea level rise, we considered the possibility of large loss of ice from the Antarctic ice sheet, which would lead to many metres of sea level rise over the next few centuries. One of the main advances of this report is that we are now able to connect human emissions with climate and weather extreme events across the globe. In particular, the new science of event attribution is able to identify the role of climate change, altering the probability and the magnitude of some extreme events. Uh, for instance, we now understand that every heat wave occurring today is more likely and more intense due to climate change. Compared to the previous assessment reports of the IPCC, this report uh, has a much more granular regional scale assessment of how climate change will affect various parts of the world. And so how we did this here was by employing um, drivers of impacts that are of climatic origin. Some examples are mean temperature, extreme precipitation, droughts, tropical cyclones, coastal flooding, like that. So what our assessment shows is that uh, almost every inhabited region in the world is already affected by climate change and that with every additional fraction of warming that more and more regions will start feeling the effects of climate change uh, in multiple ways. One of the main messages coming from this report uh, relates to changes in climatic impact drivers, which include extreme events at the regional level. And the results from this report shows that the increases in global warming levels from 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees Celsius or more, uh, we will experience more frequent droughts and more intense and heavy precipitation events. And these events are going to be felt in more regions of the world. 
One of the big science advances in this report is the improvement made in the estimation of climate sensitivity, which measures how the climate system responds to emissions of greenhouse gases. For the first time in the IPCC report, we provide a comprehensive assessment of future changes in global surface temperature, ocean warming, and sea level. In this report, we have explored a wide range of scenarios where emissions of greenhouse gases decline rapidly, remain close to current levels, or continue to increase. In all cases, future greenhouse emissions will drive more warming in the next decades. We show that a level of global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius will be reached in the next 20 years. If emissions remain near today's levels, during a few decades, a level of global warming of 2 degrees Celsius would be reached and surpassed by around 2050. This can be avoided and warming can be limited to well below 2 degrees Celsius by immediate large-scale reductions in emissions of greenhouse gases. This report reaffirms the very important finding that every emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere adds to global warming. This warming is irreversible for many centuries, if not longer. Whether we can stop further warming or not is in our hands. Limiting further warming requires immediate, rapid, and sustained reduction in carbon dioxide methane, and other greenhouse gas emissions. This would not only reduce the consequences of global warming, but also improve air quality. All life on Earth from ecosystems to human civilization, is vulnerable to a changing climate. Scientific evidence now shows that the current human-caused global warming of 1.1 degrees Celsius is increasingly impacting nature and people's lives everywhere, despite efforts to adapt to the changing climate. More frequent and severe climate extreme events, such as heat waves over land and in the ocean, droughts and flooding, have caused widespread and pervasive impacts to ecosystems, people, cities and infrastructure, and limit the chances of a livable future for all. There is new knowledge that human-induced climate change caused these destructive impacts or makes them more likely. This report is important because I think it really underscores the fact that the scientific evidence is now unequivocal. It's clear that climate change is impacting on the well-being of human societies, but also on the well-being of our planet. The extent and magnitude of climate change impacts are larger for each additional fraction of warming than estimated in previous assessments. So are the risks projected for the future. The impacts involve severe and widespread disruptions to nature and to society, reducing our ability to grow nutritious food or provide clean drinking water. The poorest communities are the ones that are strongest hit by climate change as they're least able to cope with the growing impacts. Our assessment indicates that there are between 3.3 and 3.6 billion people who live in such hotspots. These are spread across parts of Africa, South Asia, South and Central America, small islands and the Arctic. Climate change acts like a stress multiplier in these regions where people have limited access to clean drinking water, to sanitation, to health facilities or education. The livelihoods of people are also strongly dependent on climate sensitive activities such as farming and fishing. They have limited access to funding, limited accountability from governments and limited trust therefore in governments. Climate impacts are also felt differentially by men and women as they have different roles and responsibilities in society. 
This report shows that climate change is impacting every ecosystem across the globe, from high mountain ecosystems to the deep ocean, from uh, tropical coral reefs all the way to Arctic ice-driven ecosystems. We see the, the fingerprint of climate change across all of these systems. One of the other things that the report really shows is that extreme events are increasing and their effects are rapidly changing ecosystems across the globe. So marine heat waves, heat waves on land, storm events, these are driving changes to the ecosystems and species that we rely on. This is pushing species towards polar regions, it's pushing species to, to higher, cooler altitudes or down into the deeper, cool waters. And because of that, it has cascading impacts across uh, ecosystems, but also people's livelihoods and societies that depend on the services that these ecosystems provide. And as we approach the limits of what species and ecosystems can tolerate, we risk crossing what we call tipping points, these critical places in uh, the system where returning to previous conditions where recovery is less possible. Climate change impacts are magnified in cities where more than half of the world's population lives today. Heat waves amplify urban heat islands and air pollution in cities that affect people's health. Critical infrastructure within settlements, such as transportation, water, sanitation, and energy systems have been compromised by extreme weather events. Cities and settlements by the sea are specifically impacted by climate hazards. They are at the front line of climate change, being directly exposed to interacting climate and non-climate coastal hazards, such as sea level rise and destruction of local ecosystems that previously protected people living along the coast. Multiple climate hazards are also occurring simultaneously, with often cascading impacts. These impacts are becoming increasingly complex and challenging to manage. How these will affect nature and people depends on the speed and level of warming and how we adapt. The Working Group 2 report of the IPCC shows that the impact of climate change is worsened by destruction of habitats, also a sustainable use of natural resources, deforestation, and growing urbanization and population growth trends. By protecting and restoring 30 to 50% of our world's ecosystems on land and in the ocean, we help plants and animals build climate resilience. Nature, in turn, can help us regulate the climate, give us clean water, control pests and diseases, pollinate our crops, and provide nutritious food. However, investing in nature and cities alone isn't enough. To secure a healthy, livable planet for everyone, we need to transform our way of life fundamentally. Taking action now gives us the best chance of success. Where well, this report is different is that it puts our species, puts humankind into context and emphasizes that we cannot abandon this context because it emphasizes the relationship between three systems, climate, human society, and biodiversity, and indicates how all these systems influence each other. Human society causes climate change, it causes biodiversity loss, and these interactions that are underpinning this are also the source of the solutions. The science is clear. Any delay in concerted global climate action means missing a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable future. This report is a dire warning about the consequences of inaction. It shows that climate change is a grave and mounting threat to our well-being and a healthy planet. Our actions today will shape how people adapt to climate change and how nature responds to increasing climate risks. It recognizes the interdependence of climate, biodiversity, people, and it integrates natural, social, and economic sciences more strongly than earlier IPCC assessments. It emphasizes the urgency of immediate and more ambitious action to address climate risks. Half measures are no longer an option. 
Global greenhouse gas emissions from human activities are at their highest levels in human history. The next few years are critical. Without immediate and deep emissions reductions in all sectors, limiting warming to one and a half degrees Celsius will be beyond reach. The IPCC's latest report on climate change mitigation shows that there are options available in every sector that can at least halve emissions by 2030. What the report shows that if we carry on as we are, uh, we won't be able to limit global warming to 2 degrees, never mind uh, 1.5. But we do find signs of progress. I mean, half the world's emissions are now covered by climate laws and, uh, and policies, and we're seeing the falling cost of renewable energy and big take-ups, it is beginning to make a difference. So if we look over all the sectors that we, we cover in the report, we can find options everywhere for reducing emissions, both by technology technology and by behavioural change. And when you add it all up, you could see the, the capacity to cut emissions by about a half by 2030, but it would need very prompt and uh, ambitious action for that to actually happen. The energy sector accounts for about one third of all emissions. An increasing range of policies and laws have enhanced energy efficiency. And since 2010, there have been sustained decreases in cost with reductions of 85% for solar energy and batteries and 55% for wind power. Major transitions are required in this sector to reduce emissions. Agriculture, forestry, and other land use contribute just over a fifth of greenhouse gas emissions. This sector can not only provide large-scale greenhouse gas emissions reductions, but can also remove and store carbon dioxide at scale. This report shows that to avoid climate change, we have to conserve ecosystem and improve food system. We have to restore, protect, and sustainably manage carbon-rich ecosystem like forest and grassland, and we have to reduce greenhouse gas intensity of food production system. But also, we have to curve and reduce food waste and loss and shift to more sustainable and healthy diets. All these options can mitigate 8 to 14 gigatons of CO2 per year for now up to 2050 at relatively low cost. This is the first IPCC assessment to include a chapter on demand services and social aspects of mitigation, looking at how a combination of effective policies, improved infrastructure and technologies leading to behavioral change has the potential to enable emissions reductions. This report shows for the first time the importance of the social aspects of demand and the huge potential it provides in reducing emissions. Climate change affects everybody, but 10% of the richest people are responsible of 40% of the emissions. So they need to question their lifestyles, cultural norms, and eventually change them. A quarter of global emissions comes from the industry sector, where achieving net zero is challenging. Getting there would require new production processes and using low and zero greenhouse gas electricity, hydrogen, and, where necessary, carbon capture and storage. We have the tools and know-how required to limit warming and secure a livable future. Regulatory and market instruments and policies play a crucial role in strengthening the response. More ambitious emissions reductions require joined up policymaking across government at different levels and through international cooperation. Climate change is the result of more than a century of unsustainable energy and land use, lifestyles and patterns of consumption and production. This report shows how taking action now can move us toward a fairer, more livable world.